In this video, we're going to be taking a look at three topics, 1.9 through 1.11, trophic levels, energy flow and the 10% rule, and food chains and food webs. In topic 1.8, we learned that primary productivity is a measure of photosynthetic output by producers and is the basis for energy entering an ecosystem. Once that energy is part of a living thing, it travels from organism to organism on a one-way trip. After photosynthesis, the transfer of energy can be measured in a quantifiable way. We model ecosystem relationships to show the movement or transfer of energy and matter, the feeding relationships between organisms, as well as the feeding or trophic structure of collections of organisms within a habitat. Living things require both energy and matter. Energy is necessary for all life-sustaining functions. Those functions include, but are not limited to, responding to stimuli, growing and developing, maintaining homeostasis, and of course, reproduction. Matter is required in order for organisms to construct new biological molecules. Carbon, for example, is required to build any organic molecule. Phosphorus is needed to construct nucleic acids and phospholipids. Without nitrogen, proteins couldn't be constructed. So while energy and matter are similar in that they are both absolutely necessary for life, there is a critically important difference between the two and how they move or are transferred from one living thing to another. We say that energy flows from one organism to another. Energy flows or transfers from a plant to an herbivore when the herbivore eats the plant. But none of the energy the herbivore possesses transfers back to the plant. When an herbivore is consumed by a carnivorous predator, the transfer of energy is from the herbivore to the predator. Because that energy is either used by the organism for its life functions or lost to the environment in the form of heat, we say that the transfer of energy is unidirectional, one way only. Matter, on the other hand, cycles, as we saw in a previous video. For example, phosphorus in the soil is taken up by plants, which incorporate that phosphorus into their biological molecules, like cell membranes. An herbivore comes along, eats the plant, and now that phosphorus belongs to the herbivore. A carnivore eats the herbivore, and the phosphorus is transferred to it. Then the carnivore dies. Microorganisms decompose the carnivore, and that returns the phosphorus to the soil to be taken up by another plant. The cycle goes on indefinitely. Energy transfer, and matter too, of course, occurs in a number of ways. It can be to a carnivore when an animal eats another animal. It can be to an herbivore when an animal eats a plant. It can be through the process of decomposition as these earthworms return nutrients from decomposing organisms back to the soil. A parasite may extract energy and nutrient-rich compounds from a host, like this mosquito drawing blood. Fungi grow on the surface of other organisms excrete enzymes that digest that organism, then absorb nutrients back into their own cells. Scavengers, like these vultures, consume organisms that have already died from some other cause. One thing that is common about how energy transfers, regardless of how it occurs, is that only about 10% of the energy available at one level is transferable to the next level. This is referred to as the 10% rule, and there are three reasons for this phenomenon. Those reasons, non-predatory deaths, digestive system inefficiencies, and the second law of thermodynamics are going to be explored individually in greater detail. An important feature of the 10% rule that always needs to be kept in mind is that it is an average for all organisms in an entire ecosystem. Insects, birds, fish, fungi, reptiles, mammals, bacteria, plants, and more constitute all the living things in an ecosystem. Some of those organisms are more efficient than others, so the 10% rule takes that into account as the average amount of energy 
available to transfer from one trophic level to another. We're going to explore the 10% rule using actual values, which should help to illustrate the concept more clearly. Let's begin with 1000 kilocalories. Kilocalories are a unit of energy, just like joules or watts or calories. For this purpose, the unit chosen doesn't matter. The first factor in the 10% rule is called non-predatory deaths. In order for energy at one trophic level to be passed on to the next, an organism needs to be consumed. For example, in order for the energy that a gazelle possesses to be obtained by a cheetah, that cheetah has to capture and consume the gazelle. If that doesn't happen, say because the gazelle dies of some other cause, rather than predation by a cheetah, then its energy doesn't transfer to the next trophic level. Although ecosystems do vary, this is the case about 50% of the time. That leaves us with 500 kilocalories remaining. The next factor is called digestive system inefficiencies. If the cheetah does capture the gazelle and eat it, not every single molecule consumed is absorbed into the cheetah's body through its intestines. There's quite a bit of material that comes out the back end of the cheetah in the form of feces. On average, only about 50% of the energy content of food is effectively absorbed by an animal's digestive system. Now, there are only 250 kilocalories remaining. The final factor in the 10% rule is related to the second law of thermodynamics. As energy transfer occurs, and organisms utilize that energy to sustain life functions through chemical reactions, those reactions produce thermal energy given off to the environment in the form of heat. Organisms like fish, reptiles, and insects are ectothermic and lose relatively less heat to their environment than do endotherms like mammals and birds. For this reason, on average, at least 50% of the energy is lost as heat to the environment. That leaves, at most, 125 kilocalories as an average amount for an ecosystem passing from one level to the next. A comparison of the approximate final amount of energy with the initial amount should demonstrate why this is referred to as the 10% rule. We can illustrate the energy transfer, feeding relationships, and trophic structure within an ecosystem in a variety of ways. The most commonly used models are energy pyramids, biomass pyramids, pyramids of numbers, food chains and food webs, and food pyramids. An energy pyramid is useful in demonstrating the 10% rule that we just explored. It is meant to proportionally represent the energy that is available at any given trophic level. The greatest amount of energy resides with the producers. This model here illustrates 10,000 joules possessed by the producers. Each subsequent level, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers, contain only 10% of the energy of the level beneath it. It is rare for energy pyramids to be much taller than tertiary or perhaps quaternary consumers. The reason for this relates yet again to the 10% rule. Because the fox at the top of this model only obtains 10% of the energy from the things that it eats, it needs to consume a relatively large quantity of them to get the energy that it needs to survive. To support a quaternary consumer, there would need to be 10 times as much energy in each of the levels below it. Biomass pyramids show the total biomass of all organisms in each trophic level. The greatest biomass is always found at the producer level. This is true in both terrestrial ecosystems, where photosynthetic plants like grasses make up the producers, and in aquatic ecosystems, where algae and phytoplankton comprise the producer level. A pyramid of numbers shows how many organisms there are at each level. This would involve physically counting each individual organism, if feasible, or by using an estimation method to determine how many individual organisms there are. Some pyramid of numbers, because of the ecosystem being represented, may have large numbers of individual producers. On the other hand, 
Some pyramids of numbers are inverted, like this one. This pyramid of numbers is considering a single tree and all of the organisms that live in or on it as its own ecosystem. Although there is only one producer, supporting large quantities of aphids, lacewings, and starling birds, that single elder tree has far more biomass than all of the aphids, lacewings, and starlings combined. Food chains are a simple way of illustrating the flow of energy from one organism providing that energy to another organism that receives it. Just like the pyramid diagrams, food chains begin with the producers, or autotrophs, carrying out photosynthesis. The arrows connecting individual organisms indicate the provider and the recipient of the energy. A food web is actually a bunch of food chains woven together. They are more complex and show multiple pathways for the transfer of energy rather than the single path shown in a food chain. Although you would never be expected to have memorized a specific food web, keeping a few things in mind will make it possible for you to analyze any food web. The producers will never have arrows pointing to them. They obtain energy from a non-living source, the sun. Some consumers can be classified differently based on what they eat. The grasshopper mouse, for example, consuming brittle brush makes it an herbivore and a primary consumer. But sometimes, a grasshopper mouse eats pallid-winged grasshoppers, making them carnivorous secondary consumers. On the other hand, the antelope squirrel is always an herbivorous primary consumer since all it eats from are prickly pear cactus and brittle brush. The top-level consumers, like the red-tailed hawk and elf owl, have no arrows from them, indicating that they have no natural predators. It is common for food webs to not include decomposers. Decomposers obtain their energy by digesting deceased organisms, so were decomposers to be included in this food web, there would be a bunch more arrows from every organism that's already in this web pointing to the decomposers. Leaving out the decomposers declutters the look of a food web. A final note about food webs, humans are rarely included in them since, as a species, we eat pretty much everything. When ecosystems are disrupted and individual species experience decreases or increases in population, the consequences to the rest of the food web are extensive and it is practically impossible to make predictions about potential consequences if an organism in a food web was to experience a change in its population size or even be eliminated. But because food webs are quite complex, unexpected and unintended consequences are likely. If the squid population was to decrease, perhaps due to fishing or disease, fewer krill might be consumed therefore increasing their population. Then again, that means more food for the other seals. So their population goes up, eating more krill, driving their numbers down. But wait, if the other seals population increases, that means more food for smaller toothed whales, which means they eat more elephant seals and greater numbers of their food, the fish, survive, which in turn eat more krill, driving their numbers down. It should be clear that predicting and keeping track of every possible consequence is nearly impossible and a great way to give yourself a headache if you tried to do so. When an event occurs, the outcome of that event has one of two general relationships to the original event. If the outcome counteracts the original event, resulting in a decrease or elimination of the original event, we describe that as negative feedback. If the original event is amplified by the outcome, causing more of the original event to happen, that is positive feedback. In this context, negative and positive have nothing to do with bad or good, but rather the outcome or response working against or working with the initial occurrence. That concludes our look at these topics. Thank you for watching, and until next time, take care.